very nice to be here. Thanks to all of you for inviting me and uh, nice to have the opportunity to tell you a little bit about Atlas's approach to venture creation and uh, something that we call our seed strategy within venture creation. And then to uh, specifically take you through uh, Rectify, which is a company that we announced last week with a $100 million Series A. But given our early stage process and the way our, uh, our seed strategy works, which I'll tell you about, we've actually been working at it for more than a year. So it, may, it looks like the beginning, I think, from the outside. But uh, in reality, we've been at it for a while. So uh, with that, let me, let me you know, dive in. And again, thank you for the introduction. I'm a partner with Atlas Venture. Been with Atlas for about seven years. Spent about seven years um, on the operating side, building a couple of public companies before that. And then before that was a partner in Fidelity's Biotech Venture Group, um, as you heard. And so I've done a sort of reverse commute of sorts. And then earlier, my career was actually in consulting, mainly with biopharma firms, and uh, actually have an MBA from Wharton and uh, an undergraduate degree in history. So I am probably um, an anomaly a little bit or something like that in the uh, life sciences world, but so far so good. So let me tell you about Atlas and, and who we are and uh, talk a little bit about our venture creation strategy first. So we do early stage biotech venture creation for transformative therapeutics. So we're not a general life science firm. We don't do devices or diagnostics or sort of pure AI or machine learning plays. And uh, interestingly, historically, we had done some of those other things. And uh, being analytical as a group and having been in the biotech space broadly uh, defined since 1993, we actually have a fair amount of data. And over the past kind of very roughly 10 years have come to focus very specifically on therapeutics. It's a space we know our model is very well suited to it and we've been reasonably successful there. So we source globally in terms of science and technology, but we build primarily in Boston. So not only in Boston, but largely. And for the sort of hands-on venture creation that we uh, engage in, location and sort of geographic proximity makes makes a big difference. I will say that like everyone else, we've adjusted to this kind of virtual Zoom world and have become a little bit more flexible, at least in terms of where uh, people are. Uh, but that said, we really do still focus on building in the Boston or really the Cambridge area. So in terms of pursuing early stage biotech venture creation, we build companies following a range of diverse business models from multi-product platform companies to more specific asset focused companies. And I'll talk more about that and then, as I've mentioned a couple of times, we have a seed strategy, which allows us to get early signal on opportunities and to increase the likelihood of success for the companies that make it through the seed process. And so the idea is to eliminate some of the early opportunities through the seed process. In terms of the firm, we have six partners in a flat and equal partnership, which is somewhat unusual, with a strong investment team. And the only way that six people can create something like, on average, probably seven to 10 new companies a year is by really having a whole set of people um, within the firm more broad, broadly who help us to do that. We call those people either venture partners or EIRs, entrepreneurs and residents, or Atlas advisors. But fundamentally, these are very experienced biopharma executives who help us to launch and build those companies. And then within Atlas, we have a seed team that helps with recruiting operations and other key startup functions. Um, so there's a lot of kind of hands-on business building that has to occur to actually launch these. Um, as I mentioned, we've been active in biotech since 1993. We're currently investing from Fund 12 and also something that we call our Opportunity Fund, which is growth equity for both our private and public companies. And we continue to build companies in Funds 10 and 11. So that's our, that's our set of, uh, of active funds today. So let me first talk about our approach to business models and how we think about that. And so there are other firms in, in the venture capital business and also in the venture creation space, more specifically that focus on certain specific models. Everything is either a big platform and there certainly are some firms that also focus only on specific product or asset opportunities. We do both. And the thought is that it's a science first approach. So we look at the nature of the science and the technology. We think about how it can be applied. And in those cases where you can build a large multi-product platform, we're very happy to pursue that. And we also are very happy to pursue much more focused product specific opportunities. So what do I mean by platforms? These are, are either big new areas of biology or often new modalities. So a new, new approach to gene editing, for example. And we found it in Telia, 
which is one of the, uh, I suppose, three really significant uh, CRISPR companies. These companies have multiple potential products because you have to build a horizontal platform and then you're also pursuing a range of specific product opportunities. They have very high capital intensity. Sometimes that can be an offset with business development, but not always. They tend to have a physical footprint. You have to build the horizontal product platform and their ultimate outcomes from an investment point of view um, are generally correlated with the public equity markets. These companies require a lot of capital, typically more than you can bring in in private markets. And so they need to go public in order to really fuel the growth of the business. And then at the other end of the spectrum, we think of more asset-centric companies. These have specific programs that we move to value inflection points. Um, M&A is a more common outcome for these companies, although they can go public. Because they often have a single asset or very few assets, there are fewer opportunities for broad partnerships. And they're more likely to have a sort of virtual or hybrid lab model. So they don't necessarily need to build a large physical infrastructure and footprint. And so you can see the sort of dimensions on which we would define these companies, capital intensity, whether they've got real or virtual operations, and then their capital markets correlation. And the capital markets correlation is very important for, at a firm level. If you think across a portfolio, if you're building companies that can only be acquired, there may be sort of hotter or cooler M&A markets. And certainly if you think about the public markets, there's real cyclicality and volatility. And so if you build companies that can only exit through or raise capital for that matter through the public markets, you're likely to get stuck. But if in fact you have a portfolio as we do, which is split in some fashion between platforms or product companies, we're actually able to raise capital and realize exits across all market environments. And over the past few years, our shift of exits has, has uh, shifted, our mix of exits rather has shifted somewhat towards IPO given the strength of the IPO markets, but very roughly speaking or generally speaking, it's been something like 50-50 over time. Across the bottom of the slide, I have some examples of companies on the spectrum, Generation, Dyne, Rectify, and Disarm. I selected those because those are all ones that I founded um, within the Atlas world and where I was the, uh, the founding CEO and they represent the spectrum and we'll focus on Rectify in particular today. There you go. So what does that mean across the portfolio when we apply our venture creation strategy? What kind of portfolio are we building? You'll see that we cover a whole range of therapeutic areas fairly broadly, unsurprisingly, given the level of scientific advances and the activity there. There's a significant chunk that's oncology, but we also have a very large um, position in uh, neuro and CNS, which is somewhat unusual, rare disease, autoimmune, and other spaces. And the ALICE approach is very much science first. So it's a bottom up approach. We look at the science, we look at the opportunities and we build companies where we think there's a compelling opportunity to create transformative therapeutics. What we don't do is at the beginning of a fund say there's going to be a certain mix, 25% oncology, 20% rare diseases, et cetera. I will say that as we invest a fund over time, um, over its active investment period, while we're building companies and following the science, we do look up occasionally and make sure that we're not over investing in any spaces. And because science does come in waves, um, there have been periods, we might be past it at the moment, where for example, you could build an all immuno-oncology portfolio if you weren't careful. And uh, that's something you wouldn't wanna do from a portfolio perspective. So quite diverse in terms of therapeutic areas. And then similarly, quite diverse across therapeutic modalities. So small molecules remain important. Almost 40% of the companies that we build are small molecule companies. But we're very active in cell and gene therapy, in the oligonucleotide space, and then in biologics broadly. And so that's an observation about our portfolio. But I think it makes also a very important sort of statement and observation about the state of biotech these days, which is once upon a time, the pharmaceutical industry is a small molecule industry, at least in its origins. And then we introduced recombinant DNA, and that had a profound impact. And we first had exogenous proteins and then fancier proteins like antibodies. Um, but today, we have this incredible body of knowledge that, we, that continues to grow around um, disease biology, human genetics, um, and related fields. And as we see specific therapeutic opportunities, we're then able to look at this toolkit of modalities and say, what's the best way to approach that? What's the best way to drug it? What kind of pharmacology makes sense given the nature of the disease and the patient population, et cetera? And so having... Uh, been in this industry in some form or fashion since 1991, it's a remarkable thing to be here where we are today and to have all of this knowledge about biology and human disease. And at the same time, have this really remarkable set 
of new modalities. And having been at Al Nylum actually more than 10 years ago now, um, when we were still reducing RNAi to practice, I can say that you know creating these new modalities in the first time through is a uh, is a very worthwhile and a very challenging exercise. And it's uh, you know we're all very fortunate to now be in an industry where while we're still developing new modalities, we've got this full set that we can bring to bear against specific opportunities. So value uh, venture creation, rather the basics. Um, how do we think about it? So. Venture creation is really a collaborative venture creation process. And we work very closely with scientific entrepreneurs. They may be people out of industry, they are, they are often people out of academic institutions. But this approach differs quite a bit from the old kind of shop the deal approach. So to kind of put it simplistically for the sake of example, you know, in the old world, a set of entrepreneurs would find some technology, they'd sort of band together, they might bootstrap it in some fashion and they would uh, come up with a business plan. It would be extremely detailed, all sorts of uh, financial projections that couldn't possibly be accurate, not because there was a lack of sincerity or, or, or good intention on the part of the entrepreneurs, but just because it turns out it's very hard to anticipate these things. And they would shop the deal in different firms. Um, as was in an ideal situation, would kind of bid on the opportunity. There'd be competition among term sheets that would land somewhere. The investors would invest in this company they'd sit on the board and the company would go off and, and do its thing. So what we're doing today in venture creation is very, very different. We're really there in most cases at the very beginning, working with the founding scientists, really um, in a kind of peer collaborative way. And as part of that, there's a shift from detailed business plans, which you do need, but you need them later, to really more hands-on company building around a clear strategy. And that may be a little abstract. So I'll kind of elaborate on that as we sort of go through this and talk about Rectify in particular. Um, I've already said this, but it's critical. So I'll say it again. We partner with the world's best entrepreneurs, which includes academic scientists, to identify and rigorously vet compelling transformational science. We then rely on the broad Atlas ecosystem, which really means people fundamentally to assess the technology, to set strategy and attract world-class drug hunting talent to the opportunity at the outset. Um, you know, and one thing I'll say about that is that this model where we have EIRs and venture partners, et cetera, who help us to evaluate these opportunities, there's tremendous signal, and it could be positive signal or negative signal in terms of the willingness of those people to engage in an opportunity. So we have, we bring new opportunities to the sort of full firm, including this group, typically on Mondays and our, uh, the kind of stereotypical uh, Monday meeting that, that venture firms have. And we talk about these new opportunities and if a really capable um, R&D exec, who's one of our EIRs, jumps up and says, I really want to do that um, as a seed and work on it with you. There's great signal in that. And if there's silence in the room, there's also a real signal in that. And so having this kind of very large, you know, brain trust with lots of experienced people um, is helpful from the very start. As I mentioned, we source science and IP globally and we build locally. So the impression perhaps would be that because we're in Cambridge in Massachusetts that we're, you know, everything is coming out of Harvard and MIT um, or related kind of other institutions. And those are certainly great institutions. I can say of the 10 or so companies that I've been involved with, actually none of them have come out of those institutions. And so, and that's not because we've avoided that either. It's kind of the luck of the draw. But the point is that we really do source the, the science from all over the world, you know, and so that includes exotic places like St. Louis, <laughs> and Worcester, Massachusetts, you know, and Florida and Europe. And we started a very interesting company out of Singapore. So we really do genuinely look globally. And while we build locally, there is often a founding lab or a research site at the sort of origin, the source of the, uh, the science and intellectual property. So what, once we've done that, once we've identified these opportunities, we then have a seed strategy, which I'll go into a lot more detail on, but the idea behind the seed strategy is that we can evaluate risk, gain signal again, and set the foundation for new co-creation. And so as we, we'll put as much time and as many dollars are as needed into a seed. So a seed could be half a million dollars in six months, and occasionally they really turn into series A's. It could be $15 million and two and a half years. And as part of that, there's a willingness of early stage venture capitalists who do venture creation like us to actually go it alone, not for the full long journey, but in this initial period, we typically seed by ourselves. 
And as I mentioned, sometimes those seeds even turn into Series A's that we do ourselves. That said, once the company emerges and rectifies a nice example of that, we absolutely build very strong syndicates. And I'll, I'll talk in a moment about our strategy to do that. So where do we source from? Our sourcing is roughly split between academic sources and what we call de novo company creation. But de novo is not out of nowhere. It means it's new. It didn't start with some existing piece of IP, but it does not mean really out of thin air. So as all of you guys know, science and technology comes in waves and it builds upon prior advances. And so you can think of kind of like a root tree and branch dynamic. So I have a list of companies here, starting with Al Nylum, well, which is a company we were involved with, I wanna say back in 2001, initially in its series A, um, which really established the core technology around RNAi and is very clearly the leader in that space along with some other very capable companies. We then also founded Intelia, which is one of really the three kind of primary, at least first generation CRISPR companies, then Translate Bio, which is in the mRNA space, then Dyn, which is delivering oligos, so in its way like Al Nylum to the muscle for muscle diseases like DMD, and then we have a company called Coro and others. And so we typically are following a space, we're following the science in that space. We also know the people engaged in that space on both the academic and the industrial side. And so the de novo opportunities are companies that we create where we have an idea, um, but again, not an idea that came out of nowhere. There, usually there's a real kind of lineage and some history that the firm has in a given area. So where do founding entrepreneurs come from? So increasingly, and, and I find this very interesting at least, we're, we're increasingly recruiting from emerging biotech companies um, in addition to um, large pharmas. But if you rewind the clock, I, I think only five years you would see that most of the kind of new leadership talent coming into the biotech space were really big pharma executives, but we're now far enough along in the biotech space as its own kind of industry uh, within the broader kind of biopharma world that there are people who have gained real experience in biotechs who were now recruiting. And what you'll see here also interestingly is that a large proportion, it's about 37% and it's a growing proportion of the founding entrepreneurs that we work with are serial Atlas EIR. So people with whom we've been, we've had successful experiences starting and typically also exiting from prior companies at the same time though. So that doesn't mean that there's a paradox that you can't become a CEO in one of our companies unless you've already been a CEO in one of our companies because that would, that would admittedly make it difficult to bring new people in. So while the serial EIRs are a very important sort of source of leadership uh, talent for us, there's also a very large group, and in fact, it's the larger group who are first-time CEOs. And first-time CEOs are typically you know, very talented executives who have prior experiences often in functional roles, so senior R&D roles, sometimes senior business roles, but it's the first time that they've actually been a CEO. And so as a firm, we spend quite a bit of time thinking about how we uh, first evaluate people or assess them to think about, to determine with them whether they're really ready for a CEO role, but then also to support and develop them. And one example of that is something we have called the Nautilus program, which is really kind of a peer-to-peer -peer sort of training and uh, kind of advisory group across our C-level executives. Um, so we have high expectations for CEOs. We also recognize that it's a very difficult job in a lot of ways. And it's also a very a uh, unique job in the sense that if you're a functional leader, you own that function and you probably ascended through that function because of your expertise and experience within it. As a CEO, all of a sudden, you've got to work horizontally across these functions and engage with a whole different set of, uh, of stakeholders as well, certainly including your board, um, eventually the public markets, other partners and things like that. So we spend a lot of time thinking about people and organizational development. This is just a uh, nice snapshot, I think, of our, our current set of uh, venture partners, EIRs, and advisors. So I, I uh, did the screenshot on, uh, on our website yesterday when I was pulling this together. So it takes a very broad group of people. And as I mentioned, there's a huge sort of spectrum of skills and experiences here. There's some people who really are largely business executives who don't have scientific backgrounds, although they've got deep biopharma backgrounds. And then there are quite a few people, and it's really the case most of the time, people who do have scientific backgrounds um, but across a whole range of different disciplines, so biology, chemistry, other areas, of course, and also across different modalities. So there are people who come more from small molecule and people who come from more um, sort of new modality backgrounds as well. 
There we go. So how do we think about people and organizational strategy? So hiring often emphasizes, and I think necessarily so, functional experience rather than leadership and management skills. And then also, thirdly, the team mix. So if you're a small molecule company, you need a very capable medicinal chemist to lead your molecular discovery efforts. And so there's no question that that's the price of entry. But in fact, these are very kind of complex organizations and the leadership and management skills matter quite a bit. And then the mix of those skills across the leadership team and really across the organization are, are critical as well. And so in that regard, the behavioral and decision-making phenotypes that you have across the leadership team in this example and their interactions are critically important and they're not obvious from interviews. You don't know how someone makes key decisions, a chemist, when they're working with the biology team from an interview, you can certainly talk to them about their experiences as they've advanced programs, for example. And so this is why, you know, so how do you get at that? How do you solve for that problem? One very important way is to reference. And I put reference down four times. I probably should have put it five times or maybe more. I actually started to run out of space, but you really need to get a very complete 360 view of people, again, particularly in leadership roles to understand some of these, what I'm calling behavioral, and decision-making phenotype. And then we're really sort of thinking about launch and venture creation here. But as companies progress and programs progress, you have to build new functions and add people. And so you have, um, you go from a little bit of sort of the world before Galileo, where the sun revolved around the earth, meaning the initial research team, <laughs> to a kind of post-Galileo world, where all of a sudden people recognize that there's this bigger thing that we're part of and, and those kinds of transitions, I'm making light of it a little bit perhaps, but those kinds of transitions actually can be very challenging for organizations. People who are used to being at the center of things, to having a very high level of access to information, being involved in many decisions, and that's totally appropriate and in fact, a very good thing when you're launching a company. All of a sudden you have to specialize more, more and start to separate certain decisions and while I think transparency and broad access to information is always a good thing in a company, not everyone will know everything as companies progress over time. So managing these, these challenges requires anticipation and active management. And so in that context, culture matters a lot. Um, and companies also need rigorous management and experience. And I, I think that sometimes in startups, there can be a little bit of a sort of false spectrum set up. You're either a very sort of stodgy bureaucratic large company, or you're a very freewheeling, innovative, small company. And I think that that sets up a false choice. In fact, what you wanna have is a very effective culture. And there are lots of different kinds of cultures that can be effective and you wanna set that up deliberately. That also brings with it very rigorous management practices and good management is very different than bureaucracy and uh, administrative overhead, which you certainly want to avoid. So where does financing strategy come in? At some very simple level, you've got a strategy, you make corresponding plans and budgets, and then that tells you what your funding requirements are. And so if only the world were that simple and that deterministic model really worked. And so you know it's coming next, but it doesn't. And so in reality, there's an interplay among these components and they affect one another. And in fact, when we think about financing strategy, I think it's really important to recognize that financing can be catalytic. It's a strategic element itself. It's not only the result of your strategy, your plans, and then your budget. And so you want to match the financing strategy to the business model. And as I was suggesting a little bit earlier, the finance requirements for platforms are very different than the financing requirements, the funding requirements for products. And so funding can be return destroying. There's a dose response curve of sorts, particularly for product companies. You can certainly underfund, you can kind of starve a new co, and that's bad. Um, but if you overfund a company, I think you can lose some, some managerial kind of rigor um, because you want people to make choices. Choices are good. Um, and you want people to be discriminating and talk about what's the next marginal opportunity and is it worth doing? Or how do I manage risk? Maybe I want to have a certain number of parallel R&D activities, but maybe the nth one is no longer doing. And if you can easily overfund the company and kind of lose that management discipline. The other thing is that beyond some point, putting more money in doesn't drive a, a higher outcome. And so all you're doing is reducing the multiple, your kind of cash on cash return in that scenario. So there's no magic formula. Unfortunately, there's no kind of Excel plugin 
that lets you figure out what the right dollars are against a given opportunity. But what you do need to do is think through your set of plans, obviously contingencies, and then fund the company kind of well, but not excessively. And so in that context, syndicate construction, which anticipates future financing, what the path of the company will be to either an IPO or M&A is really critical. You want to play the long game. Um, and so you, you should, as a founder, care an awful lot about valuation. And you should also care a lot about kind of ultimate success. And so valuation is a consideration, but there are other kind of qualitative aspects of syndicate construction that matter quite a bit in terms of the ultimate outcomes. And you obviously need a syndicate that can support your strategy and grow through market cycles. Tranches are very common in larger financings and are kind of a good and fine thing. I think once upon a time, maybe there had been less comfort with them and maybe there was some sort of inference that people would make that somehow the later stages of financing were going to be withheld. But financings that allow you to, to play the long game, but then provide the capital as it's required um, make a lot of sense for a set of what are probably obvious reasons. So investor choice also matters a lot because your investors, when you're choosing your investors, you're actually also choosing your board and your board will have a very big impact on uh, your company and your quality of life as a CEO um, and an executive. So you want to think about that. And just as a side note, I think it's very important to bring in independent directors actually quite early in a company. Um, and so it's not uncommon to have multiple investors and venture investors typically in earlier stage companies and, and because it's not a sort of or statement, it's very uh, actually useful um, to have uh, appropriate independent directors on the board as well. And in that sense, also investors should bring more than capital. So let me turn to our seed strategy specifically, what we mean by that, and then I'll roll just in a moment into, uh, into the rectified example. And I think I'm about on time at 6.30, so that seems about okay. But you guys, you guys can tell me if I uh, start to get behind. So the idea of the seed strategy is to assess science and discharge risk before fully funding and building a company. And that sounds, I think, pretty obvious and maybe not very controversial. But the kind of old model of venture capital in some ways was that you'd find some academic science and you convince a set of um, often academic researchers to leave their positions and you give them a bunch of money and you, know, you give them $20 million in a series A, let's say, and you'd certainly be engaged with them, but they would go off and run the company. And in a couple of few years, you kind of find out that that 20 million was well spent or not. And unsurprisingly, if you do that, if you take people out of their academic positions and put them in a company with $20 million, they're probably gonna spend $20 million to try to get to the answer for all sorts of good reasons. But it turns out that not all science translates. And so the idea behind the seed is to get early signal on the science and technology. Does it repeat? Is it tractable? How can you really apply it? And academic science and industrial R&D are very similar disciplines, but they're not the same. And so very, very high quality academic work does not always translate into true industrial R&D that can be applied to new products. So during this time, you're also collecting people, you're figuring out what kinds of skills are needed, what should the launch team look like, who will you build around over time. You think about the business model and the corresponding plans, you think about the selection, are we gonna play this as a platform or play this as a product? And you might say it's obvious, isn't, isn't every opportunity one thing or the other? And the answer is no. And so I'll tell you some more about how I think about that with Rectify as an example. And then you think about your financing strategy, how much from whom and what form and when, all those things that we were just discussing. And so our experience is that this kind of early evaluation in a seed context leads to both better company and better portfolio outcomes. So the winners, the companies that make it through a seed process, and it's something like three quarters of them to use a kind of slightly round number, are much better prepared to roll forward rapidly, to move forward rapidly. They know what the technology can do. They know what the remaining gaps are. They've really thought about what the best product applications are. So one challenge with, with platform companies is sometimes there's so many things that, that, that can be done um, that they don't have focus. And so our question for platform companies usually, or our response is usually, that's very exciting. There are many, many things that can be done. What are the one or two things that can be done first and that are really worth doing, right? Um, and so if you do that, you get reduced 
capital loss ratios, right? So if you have 20 companies and you put a million into each of them in seeds and you eliminate five of them through the process, that's 5 million of losses, which in the context of a multi-million, hundred million dollar fund is really insignificant. Whereas if you have five losses after you put 20 in, that could be a 30%, right? That could be some very meaningful loss ratio before you even dealt with just what the usual success rate is and not everything makes it, of course. Um, so not everything moves forward, that's okay. And the people that we've brought into seeds usually and really almost always stay with an atlas and work on the next opportunity. So one of the nice things about the seed approach is that it's certainly the way we, we apply it or approach it is that people are really joining Atlas and they join Atlas and they work on a seed opportunity and they ask the right questions and the hard questions. And we provide enough funding and time to really play those typically experiments out. And if those are well executed and the data is negative in the sense that it says you shouldn't move ahead, that is a win. It's a kill, but it's also a win. And then those people come back in and they work on the next thing with us. And there are actually many, many examples um, in the Atlas world of we have wildly successful CEOs who worked with us and killed their first opportunity, sometimes quickly and sometimes not so quickly because you can't always get it right and uh, eliminate things early. But those people learn, we learn with them and they've turned into terrific leaders of, uh, of other Atlas portfolio companies. So with that, let me turn to the, uh, the Rectify case study now. So Rectify Pharmaceuticals launched last week on the 14th with a $100 million Series A financing. So we seeded the company, we led this round and we co-led it um, in the sense that some other firms came in and joined us, Omega, Forbion, and Longwood. And this is a small molecule company developing what we call positive functional modulators of a set of proteins called ABC transporters. And I'll tell you some more about those in a moment and how we, uh, how we started the company and how we built it over the past year and also what we're thinking about thinking about doing next. So these are precision therapies for patients with serious genetic diseases. And at least when we say precision therapeutics, it really means that the therapeutic is aimed towards a specific genetically defined disease. That's where the precision comes from. Small molecules, we're targeting this ABC transporter family, really interesting family, 48 members, and about half of them have genetic mutations that lead to loss of function and are etiologic in the sense that they really directly cause the disease. So that's very attractive. If you think about kind of an abstract framework for the kinds of opportunities that are interesting, you'd like to go after kind of causal pathogenic events that you can directly drug. It takes a lot of mystery out of it in terms of whether if you drug that, you're likely to have a therapeutic benefit. And as a sort of side note, one of the real pitfalls in, in biotech and in biotech venture capital is that there's lots of biology that's disease relevant and lots of biology that can kind of be tickled pharmacologically. And since I think humans are hopeful, um, that's certainly my take on, on humans. And because we're really good at pattern recognition, when we tickle biology with drug-like molecules, we take it as confirmation that our sort of therapeutic hypothesis is correct. But tickling biology and regulatory, statistically significant efficacy are in fact not the same things. And I think that's one reason why there's so many kind of mid-stage clinical failures, that you get lots of confirmation of kind of biological activity, but you can't actually get over that efficacy hurdle. So at least from a starting position, if you've got a genetic causal mutation that you can directly address, feels like the odds of that playing out all the way there, by no means 100%, because that's really never the case in biotech, but they're certainly much higher than they might be. So to pursue that set of opportunities, we built a platform that is four components, chemistry assays, structural biology, and then proprietary translational models. And we've chosen to build a multi-program platform around that. Um, so what we could have done, and, and we really didn't know what the answer was going to be when we started the company, is we could have picked one of the targets with a mutation, a known mutation, that ties very clearly to kind of a well-understood well-diagnosed, clinically well-characterized disease and said, you know what, that's such a layup, if there is such a thing, um, that really isn't, but you guys get the point. That's such a clear opportunity that we're just gonna build a very focused company on that. But what we recognized were a few things. One, that really about half of the members of this family, this class, do have loss of function mutations 
that you can map them to specific diseases, that they cluster around certain therapeutic areas and sort of tissue types. So there's some logic about how you would build forward. And in fact, there is a lot of very genuine synergy in the discovery assays and, all, and, and the discovery methods. And so I'll talk some more about that in a moment. So what do they do? ABC transporters export diverse substrates across many tissues. So they could be lipids, ions, peptides, bile salts. So CFTR, which is the cause, the mutation in CFTR is what causes CF, is the one ABC transporter that you may have heard of. And it's really the only ABC transporter that's currently drugged. Um, and it's really what gave us the kind of insight that one, this family you know, could be druggable and that uh, there were a much larger set of opportunities in addition to uh, CF. So it's a multi-subunit transmembrane protein. Uh, it's powered by ATP hydrolysis. Um, and this sort of gives you this kind of simple schematic of how it works. And so what happens, if I can flip the page with these mutations is that there are a variety of missense and nonsense mutations, and they give rise to sort of two sources of dysfunction to put it that way. One are protein trafficking defects. So you have a protein that if it could get to the membrane, could be functional, perhaps not at 100% of its normal pump rate, but could be functional, but it gets picked up by the cellular QC system. And so you have insufficient sort of pump capacity um, in the cell membrane. You also get loss of substrate transport activity itself. So the pump rate itself is either completely eliminated or reduced to the point where in any event, you have a loss of pump function as I'm putting it here, that leads to the disease. And as I mentioned, large family, and when you look at these mutations, they fall across a set of different tissues. And that's really important when you think about how you're building the company. So on the one hand, you've got to build this horizontal platform, this chemical biology platform for drug discovery. And then if, you, if you're successful at that, uh, which of course you hope to be, you then have to apply it to these therapeutic areas, which I think of as verticals on top of that horizontal platform. And it requires a very different kind of expertise to really pursue specific product opportunities in therapeutic areas than it does to build horizontal platforms. And a not uncommon kind of pitfall in early stage research companies is that people who understand the core biology and therefore have some insight into the clinical setting really overestimate their knowledge and insight into what happens clinically. And then they make all sorts of errors in early sort of translational development. And so translational development, when you're really going from the end of the preclinical setting into the human clinical setting for the first time, is a tremendous sort of point for value creation. It's a great opportunity. And it's also where a lot of companies get it wrong. And if you get it wrong, then you've got to ask yourself the question of whether it's a real negative. Was my hypothesis wrong or is it a false negative because I didn't understand the clinical setting well enough? And given the cost of activities at that stage, you may not get a chance to try again, even if you've decided it's a false negative. So you want to get it right. And so one way to get it right is to actually focus on a certain number of therapeutic areas or organ systems and develop deep, deep vertical expertise on those in parallel with developing the discovery platform itself. And so in the case of Rectify, one of the areas, but not all of, not the only one is the liver um, because there's, there's a very strong clustering in the liver because we will discover molecules that play across the entire target family. As you can imagine, it gives us expansion opportunities. So I always think of a sort of concentric circle model. In this case, liver's in the core, what's in the next ring out. It also gives us partnering opportunities because there are surely more opportunities here than you could pursue in any one company. And so therefore the strategic opportunity cost of partnering them is quite low. If you get, if you partner an asset that you otherwise weren't gonna pursue, there's only a gain in that. If you partner your lead program that you otherwise could have pursued, you're probably shifting value to the partner that you could have captured. So this tells us a lot about the, how the biology meets the sort of discovery platform, meets the kind of business strategy, and then what that means for the organization in terms of how we build it and the kind of people that we bring into it. So what we're doing very simply, these are called positive functional modulators, and the idea is to restore at least some level of ABC transporter function. So you can, you can address protein trafficking defects, get more transporters to the membrane. You can also affect the uh, substrate activity, the pump rate. And so we're aiming to do both of those, and it depends a little bit on the, disease, on the specific target and the disease, which, or perhaps both of those levers 
you'd want to pursue. I've already mentioned CFTR. So to do this, we've built a proprietary library. So our hypothesis, and we uh, proved at least to ourselves during the first year during the seed work that we could do this. We've identified a set of unique uh, pematypes or pharmacophores, however you want to refer to them, that allow us to drug um, ABC transporters, at least across a certain set of mutations. Assaying this activity is very difficult. This is not a competitive antagonist where you're trying to gum up the catalytic domain, right, of, of an enzyme. That kind of work we can do. It's very useful as an industry. You can outsource that. Here, we really need to look at, again, trafficking, intracellular trafficking, membrane presence, and then, you know, functional activity and pump rate. So one of the things that happened actually in a couple of years before we founded the company and that we've really extended were to build the assays and the assay systems. And then when you couple that proprietary chemistry with those assays and then structural biology, all of a sudden you get tremendous insight into the structure and activity relationship within this family. And then you're able to target hop because you're developing a drug molecule for target A, but you're also screening against B through G and you'll find out how selective it is. So it's a useful counter screen. But to the extent that you have potency, although probably diminished against some of the other targets, when you couple that with structural information, you can then again infer SAR and it gives you a tremendous amount of insight into the next molecule. And so you can see how that's sort of a very sort of accretive snowballing kind of dynamic that you can have. And then proprietary translational models are very important. And because these are genetically driven diseases, we can actually create those models in a variety of, uh, of animal systems, which is extremely useful. So you can have a fairly high level of confidence if you believe your model system that you'll translate well when you go into a human setting. So it took an awful lot of work to do this and a fair amount of time and a fair amount of money. So as I said, Atlas seeded it with several million dollars before we we raised the Series A. We founded the company with Jonathan Moore. So John, if I remember correctly, spent 28 years at Vertex and worked on the CFTR program. And so he really had the central, a lot of knowledge about how to drug ABC transporters and some real insights about how you would build the sort of cross target or a pan target system. Raj Devraj is one of those serial entrepreneurs that I mentioned. He and I built another company called Disarm um, in the axonal degeneration space that we sold to Lilly last year, very happily, good for sort of everybody. And uh, given the complexity of CNS development, great to have that company uh, inside Lilly with given their expertise and funding capabilities. So Raj is a venture partner with us, initially joined the board. I was the founding CEO, um, a job that I'm happy to take on, but should never be in for, for too long for all sorts of reasons. And so Raj was very engaged with John and sort of playing this out. And it became pretty apparent that uh, you know, Raj had a real passion for this and he and John were an effective team. So Raj actually joined as CEO and of course remains on the board. Tracy Dawson joined as COO and she actually had a PhD in chemistry, but a more of a commercial background. And then Janetta joined to lead molecular discovery and Alistair to head biology. Um, and so they've built out a very effective organization. We've brought in a great set of venture firms that I've mentioned. And, uh, and that's sort of where we are. So what do we do in the first... 12 months roughly of the seed where we connected with John. Uh, there was no IP. There was a lot of kind of know-how and experience, but there was no IP. So I'm going to count this in the de novo category, not the unlicensed IP category, but you can see that de novo doesn't mean sort of out of thin air. We did have an initial narrower target focus on one of the liver diseases, but recognized pretty quickly as we thought about what the discovery platform would need to include that once you were building that platform, it made a lot of sense to apply it across the family and that if you were gonna apply it across the family, to govern is to choose. And so we chose liver among some other therapeutic areas. It was 4 million in Atlas funding that allowed us to build and validate the assays, begin molecular discovery, come up with a priority set of targets, and assemble the founding team. And then we've raised hundred million. And the idea of the hundred million is it takes us all the way through the first human POC. Um, as I've suggested a few times, you know, the best laid plans are very unlikely to play out, but we know that in our fundamental kind of base plan, that said, that we're funded all the way through, and it gives us a tremendous amount of flexibility. We don't have to worry about partnering for existential reasons to raise money. If we partner, we'll do it because there's a good strategic rationale. 
And it also means that we don't have to raise capital prior to getting to that human POC point. Um, and the way it works in biotech for both partnerships and financing is if you put yourself in a position where you don't have to do them, you often end up doing them, but you do much better deals than you otherwise would have. And so that's a little bit of wisdom that we're trying to bring to bear here. And so the idea is to finish building the platform out to create this multi-program pipeline, expand the organization. And then we've already begun to expand the board. So Jody Morrison, actually another serial uh, executive, I'm not sure if she was literally an EIR previously, but another CEO in the Atlas world also joined the board roughly concurrently with the launch. So that is the uh, the Atlas story and the Rectify story. And uh, you know, I'll pause there and I think we've got a little bit of time for, for questions if there are any.